Peter Cahoon here with Tony Brent Rigger, Central Laboratory Manager, Rhodes Pavement Geotechnical Engineering with the Rhodes and Maritime Services. And we're looking now at the field nuclear density test. And Tony, I'm going to see our friends here dressed for the occasion using radiation film badges. Now, should we be concerned, Tony? No, but it's worth remembering that as the nuclear density gauge is radioactive, there are protocols that need to be followed and indeed the technician running the test has to be licensed and must minimise the radiation exposure to themselves and those around them. OK, moving on to the test itself. The main piece of apparatus is of course the nuclear density gauge. Now before we use it we have to perform what is called a standard count. A standard count is a form of calibration. Sort of. It's a check to determine the performance of the gauge. And to do that, we need to move to a dedicated standard count area. OK, so our workers here are at a dedicated standard count area and they've marked out an exclusion zone. Not so much because it's dangerous, but in truth, there's no need to expose people to radiation unnecessarily. Yeah, that's right. What our technician is doing here is performing a new standard density and moisture count with the gauge. And what he'll do is to get the machine to compare this new count with the average of the last four counts. It's worth noting that the standard count area is away from walls and in fact specifically needs to be 10 metres from any other radioactive source and at least 2 metres from a vehicle or structure to avoid radiation rebound and affect the calibration. How's the test going? Pretty good. If the fail symbol appears, then we have to redo the standard count until it passes or use another machine. So our people have moved to the actual site. Now, there's still a few steps before they can start the test, isn't there? Yeah, that's right. First, the test sites have to be randomly determined and then located preferably with a GPS. Then the lot is assessed for homogeneity. What exactly does that involve? This checklist helps ensure that the area being tested should be similar to all the other areas that are part of that lot. In other words, the lot should be, from a visual perspective, similar material in a similar condition. If it is not, then the lot may need to be split into sublots. First thing we need to do at the area to be tested is another standard count on every lot. This discounts any background radiation effects. And you'll notice they've parked the car and set up the cones for an exclusion zone. Yep. What they're doing now is preparing the surface using a scraper plate and brushing away any loose material. Next, we need to drill a hole. The hole must be at least 25 millimetres deeper than the depth of the test. The nuclear gauge works by giving an average density from the end of the source rod to the detector. If we have an air void between the road surface and the detector, we'll have an inaccurate measure because that air void has a density of zero and that will bring down the average and may affect the accuracy of the result, although it will give a lower result. So we use very fine sand to fill in any voids. This gives a tight seating between the housing and the road surface but we only fill where needed. The last thing we want is to create another layer with the sand. We lower the source rod to the depth of the test as stated on the test request. Then our technician will move the gauge across so that the source rod is in contact with the size of the hole nearest the density detector. Then it's time to press the button to check that the depth sensor is registering the correct depth. And for RMS work, we only use gauges with automatic depth sensors and then we step away. So it's all happening? Yes, the gauge will run through its automated sensing program. And that takes how long? About a minute. Time for our technicians to head back over. What's our next step? Simply read off and record the results. At a minimum, we record the fill wet density and the corresponding density counts, but it's also advisable to record the moisture count, the dry density count, and the moisture content. So the test has run. They'll put the source rod in a safe container before doing anything else. The rod is in a secure and safe position. Now that's all for the gauge, but they haven't finished, have they? No, they still have more to do. Now we have to take the material from where we took the readings. A lot sample. And we do that by digging directly beneath where the gauge was, collect all the material and place it into a container. I notice they're being quite accurate with their digging. It's important that the hole we make has perpendicular sides that it doesn't taper. And how deep? To the depth of the original board hole. They'll then seal the container to preserve the moisture content and then record the container number on our worksheet.
Now, Tony, I'm guessing we don't just leave that hole there. No, you guessed right. We need to fill and compact the hole with similar material to that taken out. And while that's us done, for this test site anyway, our friends here have more to do. Yes, normally the routine is to move to the next site and keep testing. OK, Tony, so that just about wraps up nuclear field testing. But run us through some of the key areas for error here. Well, the gauge needs to be calibrated at least every two years. The gauge needs to be seeded properly. Don't use sand unnecessarily. The source rod hole needs to be at least 25 millimetres deeper than the test. Automatic depth sensors can be wrong if dirty. You must check visually as well. The gauge must not be seeded on any cracks. Always use the one minute option and ensure the probe is within the layer being tested. And lastly, ensure that the excavation is to the depth of the test.